I am recording this very quick video to go over uh, your section test uh, number one for the ancient section. Uh, this is um, going to be a series of four essay questions. They're sort of short essays, um, uh, two on Socrates and then two on Aristotle. Uh, the due date is February 15th uh, at five minutes to midnight. That's 11.55 p.m. Um, so for essay questions, I'm requiring a minimum of two paragraphs each, uh, and a paragraph is a minimum, bare minimum of three sentences. And by sentences, I mean full sentences. So um, it, I should note, if your responses don't meet this minimum, um, they cannot pass, no matter how beautiful, like the three sentence response um, that you've given me to the question. You, it, you've just not met the minimum requirements, if that's what you're doing. Um, so meet the minimum requirements, in other words. So they're out of five points each um, and uh, total to 20 points. And note that this test is worth 20% of your final grade. Uh, so each question is worth 5% of your final grade. So each one's equal to um, one of your quizzes. Now, um, there's a lot of boilerplate on the, um, the, the, the test information taken from the course syllabus. Um, I've posted uh, in order to give you lots and lots of time to compose your answers, um, to think about them, to workshop them, with one another. Uh, the forums are a great way to um, sort of test out ideas uh, for your answers uh, to these questions. Uh, so um, I like this sort of testing method because uh, it's uh, rather than a do or die exam where you sit down and either you know it or you don't, uh, this is an exam where you've got the questions, you've got your books, you've got me, you've got each other, um, and you've got a lot of time to consider, think through, and carefully compose your answer. You submit better answers, you get better grades, I read better answers, my mood improves. Generally, everybody wins. Um, I'm trying to set you up for success here. Um, so I list off uh, your readings. It's Plato's Five Dialogues, The Apology and the Credo. Um, so that's two of the five here. And Aristotle's Negative Key and Ethics. Uh, it's book one, two, and section one and book three. Though I've got to say, I didn't ask you a question on book three of the Negative Key and Ethics. Um, I only had two Aristotle questions that were possible. So, um, the missed assignment policy. If you find that you're not going to meet the deadline for some sort of reasonable excuse, and by reasonable, I don't mean I just didn't feel like doing it and now it's too late. Um, what I do mean is something came up that was unforeseen. I'm very sorry if I could have another 12 hours with this assignment, I could get it to you. Um, you'll find me very forthcoming if you communicate with me um, for uh, extensions. Right? So if a day or two before you realize that there's more work than you can do here, um, if you called in, got called in for extra shifts, if you were sick, if something, like if the sky falls, right? contact me preferably before the due date or within 12 hours of the missed due date. Um, and I'll, I'll be very forthcoming with an extension. Um, but after that, um, I'm not required to accept work for, for, for this. This is just a policy so that you stay on top of your work and I can actually manage the flow of a semester where there are a lot of you and only one of me and I'm trying to get everything done in a timely manner. Um, the extensions actually wind up holding up uh, my release of assessment keys and my release of comments and grades. So uh, we try to keep this to an absolute bare minimum. Assignment submission. Um, your job is to get it to me. Make sure that when you upload a file to Moodle that you're actually uploading a file to Moodle. If you're not sure it uploaded, email it to me as well. I don't mind redundancy. It's good to be redundant. It's redundancy is good. Right? It's good to be, you get the point. Anyway, um, so uh, make sure I get it. Also double check that it is the correct document that you've uploaded because I mean, 
Uh, your William Wordsworth uh, English essay, well, it's fascinating, and I like Wordsworth, and I would read it avidly. Um, that's not a response to Socrates and Aristotle questions. So um, it, make sure I get the right document. Make sure I don't get a draft document. Make sure it's the complete document. When you submit, make sure it's the one you want to submit. Your job is to get it to me. My job is to consider it, grade it, and give comments and feedback for you. And you'll find I'm forthcoming with a lot of feedback on this. Um, and uh, one last note about plagiarism. Anything that doesn't come from your own head needs some sort of a reference. If you're quoting something or if you're referring to something that you've read elsewhere, Sparknotes, Wikipedia, somebody's blog about Socrates, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, tell me where to find it. If you don't tell me that it comes from somewhere else, what you're doing is you're stealing that from somewhere else and claiming credit for it. And this is pretty well the academic cardinal sin. Right? Um, so I have a zero tolerance policy on plagiarism in this course. Um, any textual material beyond your own reflections, you must provide a reference that guides your reader to the source of that material. Make sure to read OU's policy on plagiarism and my policy on plagiarism very carefully and ensure that your submitted work is referenced. Now, OU's policy is that I can grade your stuff and determine whether or not you have a solid understanding and a solid facility with this material, but I don't really have the authority to determine authorship. So if I suspect plagiarism, my contract reads that I have to pass it on to the Dean of Students. By the time I do that, it's too late for you. It's gone to the Dean of Students office. And if it's found to be a plagiarism infraction, academic probation, mark of zero in the course, perhaps suspension or um, expulsion from the university, these things are all possible, right? So um, you're best not to do it. Um, and my policy is that you don't fail the assignment, you fail the course. If you do that. I mean, we're talking an ethics course here, so if you try to cheat and steal your way through an ethics course, I consider you failed the course, right? So um, keep that in mind. It sounds harsh, but if you think and reflect and engage with this material, this is all within your capacities. You can do this, right? I don't ask you to do anything I don't think you can do. And if you're having trouble, contact me and I will help. Okay? So, um, those are the policies. Um, two Socrates questions, um, one on the Apology and one on the Credo, and two Aristotle questions, one from book one and one from book two. It should be fairly straightforward. Um, the first question, uh, worth five points, should sound familiar to you. It's very similar to your discussion forum topic. So you've already been discussing, you've been thinking, you've been debating about this um, for a few weeks now. Um, Socrates presents us with an epistemological position, that's theory of knowledge, uh, in which we're only able to make a negative claim to knowledge. However, Socrates is able to make positive moral claims that stem from this negative claim to knowledge. Discuss the intellectual movement from epistemology to ethics that makes this possible. So, um, you've probably already noticed um, I ask compound questions. There are parts to this question, right? So you should address the epistemology, you should address the transition from the epistemology to the ethics, and then you should explain the ethics. That's what you should do. Epistemology, just ask yourself, what can Socrates know? Why is he the wisest man in Athens? I would start there. Because he knows that he knows nothing. Well, this is the same position as the sophists started with, right? So if the sophists knew that they knew nothing and decided rather than to pay heed to any sort of ethical principles that ethics is impossible and we should just use argument to persuade to get power and money and our way, how is Socrates able to do something different? If we know that, we know nothing. Well, Socrates suggests that this is a general position. I know nothing, you know nothing, we all know nothing, right? It applies to all of us, right? So it's not just 
Socrates telling an interesting story about himself. This is part of the human condition where he says on page 27, I think, let's double check that, that what's probable, gentlemen, is that human wisdom, it, that, that, that the god is just using my name as an example. Come on, okay, where are we here? 23, 25, 27, yes, bottom of uh, page 27 um, by 23b. Uh, what's probable, gentlemen, is that, in fact, the god is wise, and his auricular response meant that human wisdom is worth little or nothing, and that when he says, this man Socrates, he's using my name as an example, as if he said, this man among you mortals is, is, uh, is wise as who, like Socrates, understands that his wisdom is worthless. So even now I continue this investigation as God bade me, and I go around seeking out any one citizen or stranger who I think, whom I think is wise. And then if I do not think he is, I come to the assistance of God and sh the God and show him that he's not wise. You see, what Socrates did here, right, is presented us with an epistemological quandary and then imposed a normative method methodology in order to meet the quandary. If I know nothing and you know nothing, if we all know nothing, then should we allow people to claim to know when they don't know? No. The closest any of us get to knowing is having a rationally justified belief. So moral reasoning becomes the key. So basically it's a set of dispositions and practices that each and every one of us has to engage in. Right? If this is actually the case, wherein if you claim to know something, I say, okay, show me your reasons. Then we together evaluate your reasons. You ought to be able to offer an account. Right? If you can't offer an account, you can't pretend like your belief or opinion or prejudice is knowledge. Simple as that. We have to do this with ourselves too. Right? So that's more or less an outline of, of what I'm talking about here, right? We have to make the transition between epistemology to ethics. How can we start with a negative claim to knowledge? I know that I know nothing. And then wind up with a series of positive should claims, right? Okay, so that's number one. You see what you do is you break it down into its parts and make sure you answer it completely. Question number two. In his fictional conversation with the laws of Athens, Socrates introduces the distinct but related notions of a social contract and tacit consent. Here's what I ask you to do. Briefly outline this argument, defining each of these distinct but related notions. Now, I should point out to you, and this is why it's important to watch the video, that this argument in the Credo starts with Socrates' theory of justice. Right? On page 52, we must always do the good, or in, in his terms, we should never do wrong and willingly, nor must one when uh, one do wrong in any way or not to another. Right? This is this is what he's. It never. It's never good or admirable to do wrong. We should always do the good. How about when we're wronged? Can we return wrong for wrong? No, because we should always do the good. How about mistreating people? Can we do that? No, because we should always do the good. How about when we come to an agreement that's just? Can we cheat on it or should we fulfill it? We should, of course, fulfill it because we should always do the good. Now, Socrates thought the argument was over here. He points out on page 53. See what follows from this? It's, it's right by the number 50 if you're using the universal notation. See what follows from this? If we leave here without the city's permission, we're mistreating people whom we should least mistreat. And are we sticking to a just agreement or not? Right? Credo doesn't quite understand this, and this is why Socrates takes on the voice of the laws of Athens. And he starts off, was that the agreement between us, Socrates? Or was it to respect the judgments that the city has come to? Oh, there is 
a notion of an agreement or a contract, a social contract, a formal agreement between city and state. Uh, wait, 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 how did I agree to this? Well, Socrates implied his agreement to this contract for 70 bloody years living in the city, raising his family, getting married, enjoying the defense of the, the local law enforcement and the defense from enemies abroad through the military, uh, taking a share of the economy, etc., 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 right? So he implied, it's a form of implied consent, right? Through either silence or an action. Now, within the context of this social contract, you see, I'm just giving you an answer here, right? Um, the laws give him three options. You either obey, you can take all of your stuff and leave if you find that the laws are not just, or, and this is most interesting, you can persuade the laws to be more just or to do better. So, the next part of the question, after you briefly outline that argument, starting from his theory of justice and laying out the agreement and the method of agreeing to the agreement, right? The question then asks you, by your analysis of this argument, what sort of duties are implicit to democratic citizenship? Well, clearly obey the law, right? But to persuade the law to do better. And this is an element, in, I think, where Socrates has kind of failed. Right. If he found the laws to be unjust, well, he should have been in the courts and arguing for them to become more just, but he didn't do that. So, it seems that he had the duty to, anyhow, um, five points, break it down into its parts, theory of justice, social contract, has a consent duties, right? That's what you're engaging with in this question. Now, um, question number three, uh, briefly discuss the function argument discussed in, uh, by Aristotle in book one of the Nicomachean Ethics. I go over this, this is my beer store guy example. Um, just be sure when you're discussing this argument to generalize more beyond the function of like a thing or the function of like a profession, right? Because what Aristotle's trying to identify is the human function. So make sure you define what he's talking about with regard to the function of all things that have a function. We know what the good is, we know how to go get it. Virtue, right? So the function of my watch is to keep time. What time is it? Oh, it's keeping good time. It's a good watch. That's the virtue of the watch, that it keeps good time, right? So that's the structure. But give me a good treatment of this argument. And um, on top of that, it's possible to discuss this argument without doing this, so I ask you explicitly to do this. Discuss how Aristotle arrives at his definition of happiness by way of this argument. Happiness is an activity of the soul in accord with virtue. How does he get there? That's what you're engaging with. Argument outline and show how the argument leads to a definition of happiness. Examples are particularly good for this question, but make sure, like I say, you're engaging with a general human function. Then finally, in book two, section four of the Nicomachean Ethics, Aristotle argues that virtuous actions themselves are not sufficient to develop a, vir a virtuous character. How, how do we develop virtue of character? Practice, same way we get to Carnegie Hall, by repeating the same sorts of actions over and over again. Why? Because it's a habitual disposition to our emotions resulting in states of character, that is, tendencies to act that we evaluate in terms of the golden mean of moderation. We know this, right? So, um, Aristotle here adds three requirements insisting that the agent must be also be in the right state when he does them. So, step one, and this is addressing a pet peeve with regard to Aristotle. Um, at the very beginning of Book Two of the Nicomachean Ethics, he drops the term state. And it's part of his definition of virtue of character, of character generally. Right? 
only he does not define state until section 5 of book 2 of the Nicomachean Ethics, right? Where he distinguishes between feelings, capacities, and states. Define what a state is. Start there. Why? Because if you are using a term in your academic writing, use the term, define the term. Aristotle used the term, only later got around to defining it. It's not good form, right? So what I'm asking you to do is do better than Aristotle in terms of your writing style, right? Define states, that's where you start, right? Next, um, defined state discussed by Aristotle in uh, section 5 of book 2 and offer a brief account of virtue of character. Right? So define virtue of character and define states. And those are two things that you're defining. Briefly discuss these three requirements introduced in section 4 of book 2 by Aristotle. Right? Now, the this is, uh, I gave you the example of kindly old Mrs. Smith and S Sneaky Pete for section two. So if you're, it, that's, that's what you would, should recall if you're trying to find um, the, the section where I discussed this. Um, so, but surely actions are not enough, even in the case of these crafts, for it's possible to produce a grammatical result by chance or by following someone else's instructions. To be grammarians, then, we must both produce a grammatical result and produce it grammatically, that is to say, produce it in accord with grammatical knowledge in us. Then down at the bottom of paragraph 3, rather the agent must also be in the right state, there's that word again, when he does them. First, he must know that he's doing virtuous actions. Second, he must decide on them and decide on them for themselves. And then thirdly, he must do them from a firm and unchanging state. All right? So, those are the three requirements. Make sure you don't just give me a list. Tell me what the heck Aristotle's talking about with regard to these requirements. I gave you a bit of discussion with that. Um, you should be in a good position um, to, to, to engage with all of these questions. Right? So you see, the trick is make sure you're doing everything I ask you to do. Because my assessment criteria, which are right at the bottom of your test, are these. All responses will be graded for clarity of your response. One of the goals for this course is to facilitate the development of skills, talking about ideas in a clear and effective manner. So clarity of the response has to be the first criteria. I ask you to do a few things in each of these questions, so I'm going to check that your answers are complete. Did you do everything? Right. In question two, I ask you to talk about duties. Did you talk about duties? Right. Understanding exhibited in your use of the course material. Like, do you get it? Right. Do you say Aristotle claims when Aristotle doesn't claim? Did you misinterpret an argument? Or do you have a solid understanding of what's going on? And the strength of the argument or insight into the material at question. Every semester, I have a few responses that are just, whoa, there is a really, really good insight in what you've written here. And I've got to give credit for that where credit's due, right? So if you notice something or interpreted something very subtle and not immediately clear about the material, right, or you raise a good question or something along those lines, that's got to be reflected in your grade as well. I've got to have a way to th say thumbs up to that. So, um, that's your first test. It should be fairly straightforward, but um, like I say, it's a writing intensive class. This is going to take some work, um, but here it is the seventh. You've got till the 15th, so that's eight days. Um, that's two days of question, right? You could spend a full two days with each of these questions. Don't leave it to the last minute. Um, leave yourself time to think. Leave yourself time to proofread it because your typos lead to unclear responses and your unclear responses are detractors on my grading criteria because you're supposed to be writing clearly and concisely about this material, right? 
Um, and please do, if I've said anything troubling or confusing, contact me. Um, I've given you lots of resources. I lift, list the readings and the video material that I've given you, which should be helpful in interpreting what the heck is going on um, with regard to this material. And, um, yeah, I look forward to reading your responses. All right? Well, um, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to contact me. On the 13th, I have office hours as well. I expect a lineup at my door. <laughs> so, um, it, come use me, right? Because normally I just sit in there getting my stuff done or twiddling my thumbs, um, and that does nobody any good, right? Well, it does me some good. But um, anyhow, come use me. It's my job. It's why they, 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 they give me the podium and pay me the big bucks, right? Okay, um, have good days, one for each of you, and uh, yeah, like I say, I look forward to reading what you make of this material.